I'm Dwayne Brown tonight on KPBS Evening Edition. It's official. San Diego's first legal medical marijuana cooperative in the city is open for business. I'm Peggy Pico with an update on drones as Amazon.com begins testing delivery service by drones today. A local manufacturer talks about other innovative uses, FAA rules, and privacy concerns. Then, Tijuana's Grammy-winning Nortec Collective joins us for a chat about their new and final album, Motel Baja. And political debate is back at San Diego City Hall as two council members team up to challenge the mayor. KPBS Evening Edition starts right now. Hi, good evening. Thanks for joining us. City of San Diego taking another step to save water. Given new state restrictions adopted this week by regulators, the city is adding a new rule to its books, prohibiting neighbors from watering outdoor landscapes during and 48 hours after it rains. Other statewide rules have already been in place here. This is California's fourth year in a drought, and the rainy season is almost over. San Diegans now have the first legal uh, location in the city to buy medical marijuana. More than a dozen patients lined up this morning outside a green alternative in Otay Mesa. Brittany Carlton from Chula Vista says she's relieved to have a close and secure location to get cannabis. Especially because it's, it's um, you know, certified, like everything is legitimate, so that's great because the other places getting shut down is just kind of weird. And then innocent bystanders that just want to medicate don't want to have to deal with that, really. The facility had a few dozen patients Wednesday on its soft opening, but the collective says today's crowd was four times as many. The CEO says he's considering opening a second location. The next time you walk across the Mexican border, an agent might ask to scan your face. Customs and Border Protection will soon be testing biometric technology at the Otay Mesa crossing. Here to explain, KPBS tech reporter David Wagner. So David, what can you tell us about the plan? Well, CBP plans on launching a pilot program this spring and summer to study whether biometric technology could boost national security. Now, biometrics are used to identify people through their physical features. And as part of this pilot program, CBP will install face and iris scanning technology at the Otay Mesa pedestrian crossing. Here's a slide from a CBP presentation laying out the agency's plans. And as you can see, people walking across the border can soon expect to see these kiosks outfitted with face and iris scanning cameras. Yeah, I recall when they were planning on rolling this out. The, will this actually be used on everyone crossing into Mexico? No, not yet. So for now, this experiment is only happening at Otay Mesa and only at the pedestrian crossing. Plus, CBP says they'll only use it on uh, these biometrics on non-U.S. citizens. But pri privacy advocates are concerned about biometrics, including American Civil Liberties Union Legislative Council Arjun Sethi. Facial recognition technology in particular poses an immense privacy threat for all Americans and really could allow us to be monitored in unprecedented ways. Sethi points out that it's not clear yet how this data will be stored or who will have access to it. CBP officials couldn't be reached for comment. KPBS tech reporter David Wagner. A state lawmaker wants the Public Utilities Commission to investigate how it reached a controversial settlement to close the San Onofre nuclear plant in the North County. The agreement requires electricity customers to pay the bulk of the nearly $5 billion settlement. In a letter, Assemblyman Anthony Rindon told PUC President Michael Picker to, quote, shine a bright light on all aspects of what led to the agreement. After revelations, the framework was developed during a secret meeting two years ago. SeaWorld has a new CEO tonight. Joel Manby is taking the helm after criticism over the park's handling of marine mammals and declining attendance as well as revenues. SeaWorld is launching a promotional campaign to turn its image around. Manby's experience includes running Dolly Parton's theme park, Dollywood, and the Harlem Globetrotters basketball team. 
Well, we've been telling you about the record number of sea lions being rescued off the California coast this year. Joining us to talk about the situation is KPBS reporter Eric Anderson. Eric, SeaWorld rescue teams have been pretty busy these days, haven't they? Yeah, in fact, they set a record for marine mammal rescues. I spoke with SeaWorld's David Kuntz earlier today. He said they've taken in more than 530 marine mammals since the first of the year. Now, the overwhelming majority are struggling sea lions. And to put that in perspective, uh, the busiest year before this one was back in 1973. Then SeaWorld rescued some 474 marine mammals. And, of course, this year far from over, so the record total could still go up significantly. And, Eric, what are some of the reasons uh, we're hearing for these strandings? Well, researchers aren't quite sure, but they do have some theories. Some federal officials suspect a warmer-than-usual ocean is forcing sea lion moms to swim further from their breeding grounds on the Channel Islands to find food. And that means that they leave their young and attended for longer periods than and that may be encouraging them to strike out on their own before they're ready. They're also checking to see whether there might be an illness at play. There has been no finding in that direction yet. And some researchers have also proposed the idea that current sea lion populations are at the environment's carrying capacity and that the recent die-offs are nature's way of managing the overall population. KPBS reporter Eric Anderson. Drones may have first been associated with warfare, but now they're nearly ubiquitous or mainstream. Peggy Pico looks at regulations trying to catch up with technology. Just this week, the FAA gave online retail giant Amazon.com the green light to test its air delivery drones or unmanned aerial vehicles. Joining me to discuss concerns and uses for UAVs is my guest, Lucien Miller, CEO of Innovative Designs in Vista. They manufacture and distribute UAVs like this one that you brought in and put here on our studio desk. Now, Lucien, many people commonly refer to uh, UAVs as drones, and in fact, back in January, a drone from a hobbyist inadvertently landed on the White House lawn, That's causing correct. a little bit of a, an issue there, but it ended up just being an error. What are the current FAA regulations for drones? Right now, there really are no regulations. They're in the process of developing a set of regulations, and just a month ago, they released their uh, national proposal you know, rulemaking uh, for people to take a look at what rules they're wanting to put in place for uh, for these drones, and that's open for comment until the middle of April. So a lot of people are, you know, making comments on what they think about those those proposed laws and what the what the issues are. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's talk about this drone that you brought in right. here. Who would use this type of drone, and and how might they use it? Well, this is a type of typical machine that a uh, like a real estate photographer may use for taking aerial photographs of a property. Or somebody might be using it for, you know, uh, construction photo updates on a, on a, a job site. Uh, or uh, amateur uh, photographers may, you know, use one of these things just for taking pictures of scenic, you know, stuff from the air. Well, it's pretty small, mm -hmm. so it's marketed, it sounds like, to for personal use and for commercial use to businesses. That's correct. Could something uh, this size, could it interfere with small aircraft, let's say like a Cessna or something like well, that? Yeah, obviously. I mean, a machine like this with a camera and all the equipment weighs about five pounds. So if, you know, you were to get up high enough and crash through the windshield of a small aircraft or get sucked into the engine of a jet aircraft, obviously it could cause some issues. And that's why the FAA regulations are stipulating that these things stay below 400 feet to avoid any interaction with civilian aircraft. And that makes me, we're, we're looking at the, uh, the, I guess it would be the motors mm -hmm. or the, what drives it here on the counter. Mm -hmm. um, are they able to go up high enough to get, let's say, like a jetliner? Are those fly pretty high? Yeah, actually, um, the, these craft with uh, enough batteries can fly as high as a couple of miles okay. if, if you, if you want to get up that high. So uh, they, there are some concerns and that's that's why the FAA is setting the regulations to keep them close to the ground and in, in actual practice 90 percent of the use of these things is done down below 100 or 200 feet at the most so it's really not an issue staying below 400 feet. I see them on the beach sometime looking at surfers. Today mm -hmm. Amazon uh, began testing their air delivery drones. Right. Do you know what they're going to be looking at specifically? Primarily they're, go they're going to be looking at safety records. That, that's the main concern of the FAA uh, is maintaining safety records and uh, equipment use and how, you know, 
how many uh, flights are going to be able to get without incident, and just to see how the craft are going to interact, you know, in the airspace. Uh, State Farm Insurance also says they're looking mm -hmm. at testing uh, drones to inspect houses after natural disasters. Right. What are some other innovative ways that companies are looking to use uh, these? Well, uh, we're working with a company now that's using these to do uh, precision agricultural uh, uses for laying down fertilizers and pesticides. I mean, there's there's people using them for safety, uh, you know, like air ambulance use and other things like that. Uh, Medical use, right? Uh, absolutely. Like kind of a, a search and rescue mm -hmm. or a, a it looks like here that they're delivering a, a some sort of device to help somebody who, who's uh maybe had a heart trouble. Yeah, they've, they've got a flying defibrillator now that can actually fly into somebody that's had a heart attack and get to them in just a couple of minutes and allow somebody to, you know, resuscitate their heart. Um, and they, they, they uh, have said that they could probably save a couple of hundred thousand lives a year with this kind of technology. Mm -hmm. And search and rescue as well, right? Oh, Those absolutely. are being tested. I oh, understand yes. they're, they're the, making ones that land on water maybe? Mm -hmm, they are. They have mm -hmm. some that are capable of landing on water and they're, they're currently using them in Canada for search and rescue purposes because they have uh, already put rules in place up there to use these devices. There's been a lot of uh, web chatter this week, uh, warning, uh, it was a hobbyist, I think, with a drone. He was warned from the uh, FAA mm -hmm. to not post his drone footage on YouTube. Mm -hmm. What do you say to people who are concerned about UAVs or drones invasion of their privacy? Well, there's always been, you know, uh, voyeurism laws on the books for years. You know, you can't get binoculars and look in your neighbor's window or th anything like that. And uh, the truth be told, uh, on these types of craft, they usually have very wide angle vision cameras that c can't really see much in detail. They're more for doing large panoramic shots. So unless one of these things is like two feet outside your window, they're really not going to be able to see anything. So it's, it's really, you know, uh, not, a, not a real concern. All right, Lucian Miller, thanks so much for the update. Well, thank you. During San Diego's financial struggles and mayoral sexual harassment scandal, partisanship took a back seat on the city council. Now political debate is back, as KPBS Metro reporter Taryn Minto tells us about two council members teaming up to provide opposing viewpoints. January 14th was Mayor Kevin Faulkner's night. It was the state of the city speech and Balboa Theater was packed. Officials from around the county attended to hear the first year mayor's grand ideas for San Diego. Mayor Kevin Faulkner. But while Faulkner had the stage that evening. Thank you, thank you. Good evening, San Diego. Bienvenidos a todos. Councilman Todd Gloria and David Alvarez were the final act. After the Republican mayor's speech, the Democrats held a news conference to give their response. What aspects of the speech did you like? Well, you know, I have a tremendous amount of respect for Mayor Faulkner, but I think that it's incumbent upon us to, you know, explain to the public how do you solve problems. And that requires details that sometimes require hard truths, and there weren't too many of those in the speech tonight. A few weeks later, Gloria and Alvarez teamed up again to speak out against proposed electricity rate hikes. We're concerned because sed &E customers that are the most effective at conserving electricity are going to be punished by this rate. Last month, the council duo issued a joint statement questioning the role of the mayor's stadium task force. This is a shift from last year when, as council president, Gloria often palled around with Faulkner. As the council president, you have the responsibility to lead the legislative branch of the city's government. Uh, and that requires working closely with the mayor um, to ensure that the city is moving forward. That changed in December when Gloria was ousted as council president and replaced by Democratic Councilwoman Sherry Leitner in a controversial vote. I don't think it's radically different, but I do think my, my role has changed. And because uh, I have to provide more of my time as oversight, more of my time as sort of accountability measures on the executive branch, uh, you're likely to see uh, me point out those times uh, when something is perhaps amiss or in the case of, say, the Climate Action Plan, to be right along the mayor's side. Alvarez says pointing out when something's amiss is crucial to their role as council members. I think you have to have an, an opposing voice. You have to have questions. You have to have checks and balances. And to the extent that uh, council member Gloria and I can do that, it's great. Political consultant Tom Shepard says that's the way San Diego's political system is supposed to work. Part of their job is to question the mayor. And I think the fact that Alvarez and and uh, Gloria have started to do that more aggressively is healthy. That's the way it's the, the system's supposed to work. That system is the strong mayor form of government that voters permanently approved in 2010. Shepard led the campaign. The 
intention of that measure was to create this adversarial relationship between the two branches of government so that there'd be checks and balances. And I think to a large extent that's worked. The kind of happy days approach that we had back in the early 2000s where everybody slapped each other's back and nobody talked about anything unpleasant, that's gone. There's an open debate about things. Both Gloria and Alvarez say they've individually contributed to that open debate throughout their time on the council. I don't think anyone would have characterized my first four years at City Hall as being a wallflower. He pushed for a year-round homeless shelter and made infrastructure attractive with his Sexy Streets campaign. Alvarez voted against the convention center funding plan that was later ruled illegal, something he and Gloria actually disagreed on. I think you saw me as a very strong voice, not in opposition, but in in, in really asserting my, my role as a legislator. But he says pairing up with Gloria now was a logical step to take. We've got two voices rather than one on, on being the checks and balances, and I think that's very important. But some think the duo does have a greater plan in mind. Gloria and Alvarez's State of the City response caught the eye of San Diego City Beat. In an editorial, the magazine claimed Gloria was considering a mayoral bid and had a running mate in Alvarez. So will Gloria's name be on the 2016 ballot? I don't know. Uh, in the the truth is is that a lot of people are encouraging me they to do so and um, and that's really heartening. At the council president vote in December, dozens of Gloria supporters pleaded with the council to keep him as the body's leader. I really implore you to please maintain this course of action and maintain Todd Gloria in the presidency. Ultimately, Gloria's Democratic colleagues put their support behind Leitner. Well, except for one. The political thing for me would be to not stand with Todd and say, sorry, looks like you ain't going to take this and I'm going to go with somebody else. But that's not what I do. When Alvarez ran for mayor last year and lost to Faulkner, Gloria backed him up. So will Alvarez do the same if Gloria decides to run? I think Todd would make a great mayor. I think he's already proven that he was a great mayor in the interim period. Mayoral candidates won't pull their nomination papers until next February. Taryn Mento, KPBS News. Sixteen years ago, Tijuana's Nortec Collective created a new style of music blending Mexican Norteño music with electronic beats. Peggy Pico talks with the artists about their latest and final album. In their final album, Motel Baja, Grammy Award-winning Nortec Collective continues to tell the complex story that is Tijuana. <laughs> This is their latest video from the track Camino Verde. Welcome Nortec Collective's Ramon Amasqua, the artist known as Bostich, and Pepe Mode, also known as Fusible. Welcome to Evening Edition. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Now, you guys started out as DJs and are credited with inventing this Nortec sound. What does your latest uh, album, Motel Baja, actually represent? I'll start with you. This album uh, is very important for us because uh, this album represents the, um, the, the sound that Pepe and I expected uh, that is going to be since we started this sound uh, 16 years ago in 1999. When we started this sound, we trying to dream or imagine these sounds will be um, something that represent the sound from Tijuana and something that uh, is uh, uh, a kind of uh, taking elements from our city, sounds uh, from Norteña and this traditional Mexican music and electronica and recycling these sounds and do something new. Uh, when we started, we, we, we imagined that these sounds will only, the lifetime of this sound will be only one or two years, but last 16 years. <laughs> it's lasted and it's, it seems like it's evolved a little bit, Pepe. Um, as you know, Tijuana's experience in a revival of sorts. How has that, or has it, I should ask, and the uh, border culture in Tijuana, how has it influenced your music? Well, a lot. I mean, uh, as you remember, like a, a, a few years, like uh, eight or, or eight or seven years ago, it was like a little you know, violent, the, the border was like a, a mess to cross. But right now, I mean, the, uh, in the last uh, three or four years, it's, it's like everything is revival. You see more people from San Diego going there. 
uh, you have more places for music, uh, uh, wonderful places for for food, <laughs> and even for um, it, it was like a it's 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 like a happy city right now. It's very safe. It's really warm. Uh, the people is is like. Oh, it's, it's going out to this out of the street. So that reflects on our music. Sure. That's why Motel Baja is, is kind of like this happiness in the, in, the, in the record. It does. It does sound a beat. Did you ever worry that back in the day you might be glorifying the violence at the height of the drug war? Oh, well, it's, it's, it's not like, I mean, we uh, in every record we represent what's going on in the city. It's more like a, like, you know, like, we we are committing of of representing what is exactly going on in in the in the violent days. Of course, I mean our music wasn't violence, but uh, but but you know spell out the world where it's happening there. It was uh, really was so sad back in the day. But right now, I mean, there's no violence anymore. Everything is good. So that's why the record is reflecting that. It does. Ref <laughs> it does. You can you can notice the difference yeah. certainly. Uh, what do you enjoy most, uh, Ramon, about making music? Oh, uh, I think. Uh, yeah, I enjoy it because for me it's not a job. I just left my career. I, mean, I was a, I am a dentist, and I left my career uh, four years ago. Uh, I enjoy it, but now as a musician, I enjoy it a lot. We have been traveling around the world with this sound, and um, I think for me it's totally joy to and do this. And, and how about you? Why, what what's your favorite part about making music? Well, it's to uh, it's to create stories. Uh, with melodies, so for me it's like to create something that will remind me a certain experience in my life and a certain experience that I got in different. It can be in Tijuana, but it can be in other places, but with the, with our own sound. Why are you saying farewell to Nordic now? Because well, <laughs> you're right. You're talking all the hard yeah, yeah, ones yeah, to yeah, 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 yeah. All right, it's, it's well, on you. <laughs> it, it, it's, it, it has been 16 years doing this sound. And and it was a, a, a cultural project that we started because it was a collective for uh, artists, you know, painters, graphic designers, musicians, uh, architects, and and too many people. But now, after 16 years, we got this last album called Motel Baja, which represents all the experience we has we have with these 16 years. So for for us, it's, it's it's enough for that sound. We love it as it, as it as it is right now with Motel Baja. We love a lot this record that we decided like say goodbye to the Nartex sound, and we're going to do other type of music uh, afterwards. That's my next <laughs> question there. For more music for you, more music for you as well? Yes, uh, we, we are going to continue with uh, our passion, that is uh, doing electronic music. Uh, this album, as Pepe told you, um, is very important for us. We have a collaborations with people that, people that we ad, 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 admire, admire, have a lot of admiration for them, uh, as uh, Kraftwerk, Vulcan Flo from Kraftwerk, People from the group Talking Heads, uh, even Señor Coconut, <laughs> and so this album is uh, very important for us. And the next step is stop doing this uh, kind of uh, fusions or the accordions tuba and continue our passion of electronic music. All right, uh, Norte Collective, mm -hmm. Ramon uh, Mesqua, and uh, Pepe Mote. Thank you so much for talking with us. Thank you, Thank you very, very much, much for inviting us. Thank you. The Federal Review of the SDPD finds room for improvement. Government leaders in Baja accuse a newspaper chain of extortion, and the Salton Sea is still shrinking, still dying, and still dangerous to public health. I'm Mark Sauer. Join me for the KPBS Roundtable tonight at 8.30. The NCAA Men's Basketball Tournament, better known as March Madness, features San Diego State on the road tonight against St. John's. The Aztecs are playing in the big dance for the sixth year in a row, but you wouldn't really know it if you talk to students on campus today. It, it probably kind of lost its luster after a while. R.J. Scott was watching the NCAA tournament on campus between midterm classes. He's a freshman at SDSU. Like you make it for the first time in a long time, everyone's like really pumped for you. They're excited, they're motivating you. But if you go six years in a row and you don't take home the title, People just kind of lose faith, you know? Bill Flint was watching the tournament, too. He works in the IT department on campus. It seems subdued, you're right. But I'm wondering if everybody isn't hidden out in the corners watching this someplace on their computers and mobile devices are so enabled now, you don't have to be in front of the TV. The single elimination tournament means every game is a must-win, producing tense, dramatic finishes. San Diego State is just one of the 68 teams vying for the championship. 
That number will be whittled down to 32 teams over the weekend. We have our hopes, but if we do win tonight, we do play Duke, so that's very that's, that's a tough uh, opponent for our next game if we do win. That's a big if from Jim Ballesteros, a junior at San Diego State, who remembers what it was like last year when the Aztecs had a better ranking going into the tournament. Uh, I think it's just the fact that you know, last year we were more expected to go far. Uh, we were, I believe, a fourth seed, opposed to this year we were being an eighth seed. Fairweather fans are common in sunny San Diego, and that reminds me of what Coach Steve Fisher told me in 2011 when the team scored its first national ranking in 41 seasons. You know, when success happens, you know, you everybody everybody's your father, and when and when it's a struggle, you're an orphan. Ain't nobody there. So we talk about that, too. The Aztecs face St. John's with tip-off beginning at 640 tonight. The game is being televised. Warmer weather ahead on this first official weekend of spring. A mix of sun and clouds expected along the coast in the low 70s, mid to upper 70s for the inland valleys with more sunshine, some high clouds. 60s in the mountains and partly cloudy on Sunday. Upper 80s and low 90s for the desert with plenty of sunshine. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. Have a good night and a great weekend.